Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday, December 1st. It is time for the Knowledge Bolide Hangout, sponsored by Topher Spin Meteorites. And today is our 80th in a row. This is the Albright that was found in Algeria in 2021. It was originally classified and classified as NWA 14185, but that was only for 1,100 grams. There's like 60 kilos of it. It hasn't hit the Met Bowl yet, but it's been approved. It is now, and you guys want to say that with me? Dujatu. Dujatu 101. I know that's not the way the word looks, but that's how you pronounce it in Arabic. We've had a few people on YouTube reach out, more than a few, swabs of people want to reach out and send samples. So I wanted to put this up there so you can grab a screen grab of exactly how I recommend going about it. There's two real good group on Facebook called Is It a Meteorite and Meteorite or Meteor Wrong. Jonathan reached out to me and he found a iron something. <laughs> According to Jonathan, it is now uh, confirmed as a meteorite by ASU. A 20 gram sample will soon be cut and sent to Dr. Christopher Hurd at the uh, University of Alberta. And we are looking at a iron meteorite to be. So, booyah. It can be done. It's not done every day, but I highly recommend the, the way to go about it is to follow the instructions and go to these professional organizations. We have a really super awesome event coming up, and I'm calling it an event because we're building the entire hangout around it, and I just, I'm honestly overwhelmed that we, that we were able to get Dr. Ed Liu. He's with the B612 Foundation and just an impressive, impressive man. He serves as the executive director of the Asteroid Institute. So all these Asteroid Day events, this is the foundation that puts them, them on. Um, he oversees the research that's building a three-dimensional map of the asteroids in our solar system, and they're protecting us from near-Earth uh, impacts and objects. And they're also mapping, it was explained to me, they're mapping it in, fourth, in four dimensions, that fourth dimension being time. So we can look at the inner solar system and where Earth is in danger and then spread that map out over time and find out when we'll be in danger. You should know that he is a three-time astronaut. Wow. Twice on the space shuttle and he even flew to, uh, on Soyuz to the International Space Station. Just amazing. He spent 206 days in space. And these are some highlights of his missions right here. The lead spacewalker. So he did a six hour spacewalk to construct the International Space Station. So with that, we have our resident geologist, Mike Kelly. He's gonna explain to us Eurolites. And that's our, our topic for today is Eurolites. So. Mike, if you're in the building, if you could take it away, man. This is kind of the current thinking as to uh, exactly uh, what the history from formation to us getting Eurolites looks like. There's still a lot of gaps in our knowledge base on, on what we actually know about them, and we'll cover some of the cooler aspects of that. Uh, and the interesting thing to kind of put a, another twist in the story is Nova Uri is not actually the oldest Eurolite fault. Dhyalanpur in, uh, in India in 1872 is actually older than Nova Yuri, but Nova mm -hmm. Yuri got the type name. So uh, Uralites by the numbers, again, this, this is actually a very large group of, of meteorites relative to the achondrites. Uh, so this follows right behind the HEDs as far as numbers of, uh, of meteorites that we have. So the Uralite parent body formed and differentiated, and that's where you see the big, uh, you know, jawbreaker, multicolored ball there. Then a large, large impactor came and hit it, and you see the impactor coming from above. And again, you know, high shock, so theoretically that's your, your formation of, of the diamonds. Now we have our resident thin section photography expert, Marissa Fennedy. Yeah, I've just been playing around with uh, um, some more wavelengths and I've got two different wave plates. I, I'm just enjoying pictures and I'm trying to learn as I go. But uh, the different wave plates from my understanding, I think you bend the light a little differently and you get different color variations that can help you determine mineralogy. 
these are amazing photos, Marissa. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that one's probably my best one since yeah. I got completely to the edge in focus. I don't know if I can do that again. Everything <laughs> kind of just came together beautifully, and my phone decided to cooperate very wow. beautifully. Yeah. Whoa. That is uh, a new technique I'm doing for, for more artistic reasons. The wave plate is a piece of material that is placed in the, the optical path that shifts the, the light by either a quarter of a wavelength or one full wavelength. So I just have one year of light to show off today. Bam. Whoa. So this is, uh, wow. this is NWA 14451, I think. Um, it's my new classification. Um, I sent it in, Tony Irving. This is the piece that I'm keeping. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that's, that's technically the main mass. And the cool thing is when I, when I got it, it all fit together like a puzzle piece. Oh, sweet. So that's the science on it. One of the things that Mike Kelly brought up that's actually pretty interesting is that, um, this one mentions augite. It should be hitting Metbull um, within the next update or two. Uh, Mr. Vargas was quite generous Ooh. and sent along a slice wow. of NDBA 14451, his brand new Urolite. That and is beautiful on the inside and on the outside. This, this had to be torturous to cut. They... Uh, are notorious for moving saw blades around. Our resident Eurolite our expert today, Mike Kelly, cut that for us. Oh, nice. Oh. Lewis. And there's, here's the other side. And, and this, this isn't super high magnification, but you can still get an idea of the triple junctions. Uh, this one I got from uh, Dave New back in the 90s, 3.2 grams. Daral Ghani 319. This is a polymic brachia. And I, I think have we have a we have the most Eurolites in one collection of the crew right here. <laughs> and then this is uh, oh, you a got tiny piece oh. on the oh. Al Hamada Siddha. I published a, an, a review article in a meteorite magazine. Uh, they actually found um, extraterrestrial amino acids in a Eurolite. A couple of the ones that I have. Um... Greg had already showed uh, Kenna. So this is my little bit of Kenna. Um, and again, it's, it's a pretty cool American one. I'll go, uh, I'll go after this, try to go pull and see how many American ones there are. I know I ran across, um, uh, Bob Verish had found one that was uh, a little like two grammar, but it was like super oriented and it was crazy. Cause I'm, I'm guessing there are not all that many American uh, Eurolites out there. Pat, congratulations on your little piece. This is my tiny little piece of Roberto's uh, new classification. If you get a chance, get it out in the sunlight because it's got some crazy looking kind of reddish tinted uh, glints in it, uh, which wow. I would love to, uh, to figure out what that is. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out in direct sunlight. <laughs> this, is, this was my uh, piece of the, the polymict. Uh, so you can see up there at the, the one o'clock, that's that big uh, C1 slash uh, two carbonaceous mm -hmm. inclusion in there. Nice. Um, and uh, under the microscope, yeah, it's really, it's cool to see the breccia in it and all the different pieces in there. There's some uh, some big bits of olivine in there under the scope that are, that are nice and green looking. These are all various pieces of Almahatta Siddha. And I've, I've shown this off once before, but since we're talking Eurolites, um, there really is a, a huge, really cool, diverse... A uh, bit of urolytic material in there. So even the things that are monomic urolites, there's fine grain, medium grain, and coarse grain urolites. There's little things like <clears throat> bits of H chondrite in there. Is the main mass from uh, NWA 13239. Uh, it's 115 grams. And this is like pretty much the only Eurolite in my collection. It has a really unique exterior. Yeah. They just look hard. The, dense. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I'm super happy with it because uh, a main mass and a Eurolite. 
So yeah. I checked two yeah. boxes off. Yeah. Cool. And it's good size. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This one right here, I just got this morning. <laughs> wow. Uh, do we have any guesses at the weight? Uh, um, <laughs> this puppy is definitely available, but I like to remain a mass holder of it. So I'm willing to split this with somebody. Wow. I haven't had a chance to really review it yet because I've been at work, but uh, super cool and very, very dense. So there's a lot of expense that goes into cutting um, urolites, but they're extremely rare. And through today's uh, um, education with, with, uh, with Mike Kelly, we've learned to appreciate them from a scientific point of view as well. Yes, uh, this is a, a urolite that I purchased from uh, Topher. Uh, NWA XXX, and uh, it was a uh, find in 2019 and identified by Dr. Tony Irving. The urolites are really gnarly and uh, and, and just weird looking. They definitely don't look like the the normal um, meteorites that we all think of. You know, an oriented, dripping, fusion crusted meteorite. <laughs> All right, so I got something new. Um, this is provisional NWA 14448. It's a Howardite. Ooh. Ooh. So, uh, as well as being a guard trial, the reason that I've got my finger and hand in a glove <laughs> is because of this. What oh. the heck? Oh. Um, yeah, so <laughs> has anybody else ever seen an iron inclusion in a Howardite? No. No. That would have to be part of the impactor, I think, but that yeah. is exceptionally large for being an impactor bit. Look at that. That is yeah. crazy. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. wow. Yeah, that is by far the largest metal uh, inclusion wow. I've seen in any Howardites. Yeah, you show it to us just in, just in case we're interested. <laughs> yeah, we're interested. <laughs> is there a sister? Like I'm selling it, but it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Pat, there was a YouTube question that I'm hoping you can answer. It was about potential non-destructive ways to analyze or potentially classify a meteorite. And the reason they were asking is sometimes there's a oriented meteorite, even an oriented iron, that you would not want to cut for aesthetics. But there right. still may be some secrets that can be unlocked through x-ray technology so pat over to you yeah so this is this is a very interesting question and and i think a very timely one in that that uh, some of these meteorites are just too pretty to cut up one of those schemes that uh, has been applied to some degree is uh, cat scan or you know computer aided tomography huh. Where a uh, an x-ray source and an x-ray detector are spun around uh, a sample that uh, and a number of, of slices are taken in the z-axis and then they're reassembled in a computer. That uh, really isn't a classification technique. Uh, it, it's more of a... Uh, Morphology technique. Yeah, exactly. To, to try and see some of these 3D structures. For classifying irons, we don't cut a petrological thin section in the sense that we do for stony or stony iron meteorites, but they do a thick section that is polished on the top and then it's, it's put into the scanning electron microscope. And elemental analysis is done, but in a very, very fine sort of way, looking at a very small spot size. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the short answer. sort of led off with that. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, that brings us to the end of tonight's uh, Knowledge Bolide Hangout. I do want to make an announcement that next week's topic, thanks to my beautiful wife, is going to be pretty palisites. And yes, I have to say that. Pretty palisites. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.